I know you pick your nose. And if you don't pick your nose even just a little bit, I don't think I can trust you because you're probably a robot. The fact is, picking your nose is part of what it means to be human. But with that said, if you're two knuckles deep looking for buried treasure, that's definitely not a good way to go about it, and your nasal anatomy would agree. And that's why in today's video, I wanna talk all about nosebleeds. Have you ever really thought about this? Like, take a moment to think about it. Why is it that I can scratch, or you could scratch pretty aggressively all over your entire body, but if you stuck your finger up your nose right now and did that same thing, we all know what would happen. That's what we're gonna figure out today. What makes the nasal cavity and the nasal anatomy inside of it so different from other places that you can palpate? It's gonna be a gross one. Let's do this. Let's start off by orienting you to what we're looking at and then we can more fully understand nosebleeds. So first off, this right here is a head that has been cut in the mid-sagittal plane or right down the middle. This is the anterior direction, which makes this the posterior direction. Uh, you can even see the cervical spine right there. This is going to be the tongue. And then this would also then be going up towards the brain, which we've removed, which would be sitting in here. So that's gonna make this portion that I'm outlining with my probe, the nasal cavity. And this is gonna be the important area we're talking about today. Now, before we get into the nasal cavity, you obviously have a nose, and that's what, again, this is right here, um, in front of the nasal cavity. Now, I'm not gonna do this, you're welcome to do that. I, I'm covered in preservatives, but if you're at home and you wanna just start touching and moving your nose, feel free. The nose is going to be soft, flimsy, but still firm and rigid. That's because it's made of cartilage, specifically what's called hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is found all over the body. Uh, it's really good at reducing friction, so you like to put it in places like joints, really good for the bones rubbing against each other. But think about when you're breathing in and out, that's a lot of airflow. So it makes perfect sense that you'd wanna have something that's really good at reducing friction in that area. But the main reason it's made of cartilage and not entirely bone is because you want it to be able to deform under pressure. And so think about it, if uh, you, you got punched in the face, which your nose is a huge liability, it's just sticking out there. Imagine if it's all made of bone and you just get popped, right? You could just completely break your nose. But also laying on a pillow or anything like that, just pushing it, it makes sense to have it be soft and flimsy, right? But still be able to retain its shape more uh, most of the time. But that actually begs the question, if the nose is made of cartilage, what are you actually breaking when you break your nose? And I, this is actually, I actually broke my nose. If you look at my nose, you're gonna see, I forget which direction it is, but it's skewing to one side or the other. When I was 16, goofing off with one of my friends, we're just kind of like play fighting, and then he just pops me in the face and breaks my nose. I never really got it in, taken care of. I mean, I'm 16 and irresponsible. Um, but the real question is, what did I break? And so if we come over here, so if the nose is made of cartilage, there's another structure here I wanna point out to you. This is part of what's called the nasal septum, but this is the cartilaginous portion of the nasal septum. We've cut a window here, but what we removed in order to see these structures there is the rest of the nasal septum. And this was made of bony tissue. So you've probably heard of a deviated septum. The septum is a divider divides the nasal cavity into left and right sides. Part of it's cartilage, part of it's actually gonna be made of bony tissue. It's possible when you get hit in the nose or whatever happens, that you could break that bony portion and that could be part of your broken nose. Another thing it could be is up here, this is called the nasal bone. There's gonna be two nasal bones, one on either side, and they're coming off of the frontal bone here. And what happens is the cartilage just comes off of it so to form that cartilaginous flimsy part of your nose, as does this cartilaginous portion of the nasal septum. So you could either break the nasal bones or the septum, and that would make sense to be breaking your nose. So again, appreciate the fact that your nose is primarily made of cartilage, because that would be, that'd be such a rough injury if your whole nose just shattered. It'd be a rough day at the office. But going back here, so again, we removed the nasal septum so we could see these deeper structures here. These are what are called conchas or conchi. So we have an inferior nasal concha. So I'm kind of outlining it the best I can with a probe. And then we have a middle nasal concha. And then we have a superior nasal concha. 
So a conch, these are also called turbinates. So some of you probably heard of them be called turbinates. These are bone, bony structures that are actually like they come down and then they actually like, they curve around. And what that, that curving does is it actually increases the surface area inside of the nasal cavity. So more air, so air can actually come into contact with more of this tissue that's on top of it. Because you can see it doesn't really look like bone, even though there is some bone. I don't know if you're gonna be able to hear it, but there is some, these are bony structures that are wrapped in mucosal membranes, connective tissue, epithelial tissue. And the reason that's gonna be very important for the function of your actual mucosal membranes, but just understand these conches are going to just come down and circle around dramatically improve and increasing the surface area in that space. But there's also passageways between them. So you're probably not gonna be able to see this all that much, but my probe is actually going underneath this inferior nasal concha. This is called the inferior metis. And then right here, you can definitely see this one. This is the middle metis. And then there's a superior metis. These are the passageways. Metis just essentially means passageway. This is the passageway that air will take as you're breathing it in. And then it'll go to your nasopharynx, and then it'll go down to your pharynx, and then it'll go down to your respiratory tract. So to really understand nosebleeds, we need to understand the mucosal tissue, these mucosal membranes, because these are highly, highly vascularized tissues. And that's on purpose, because think about it like this. When you take a bite of something that's too hot, what are you, what are you gonna do immediately? You're gonna take a bite, and right? Or you spit it out. But let's say you breathe in really quickly. When you're doing that, you're cooling it down. When you're breathing in through your nose, well, what's happening is you're also cooling down the air. And that's not a good thing for your respiratory tract. So what exists inside of these mucosal membranes is a bunch of superficial blood vessels that are there to warm up the air so you don't freeze out your lungs and respiratory tract. Now, these don't just exist here on the conches, they're also going to line that nasal septum as well. And in fact, the most vascularized area of it is right here, what I'm tracing with the probe. This is called Little's area, or the Kieselbach, Kieselbach plexus. And this is an area where several blood vessels are all converging, and it's so superficial. 90% of nosebleeds happen right here in what's called an anterior nosebleed, or the real name is epistaxis. That's the fancy name for nosebleed is epistaxis. So you can have an anterior epistaxis, or you could also have a posterior epistaxis. So if you have a bleed back here, pretty much anywhere other than Little's area, that's defined as a posterior nosebleed. And this one is far more rare, and it's actually more dangerous because if you notice, again, we go back, the nasal, the nasopharynx is right here. Blood can start pouring down the back of the throat and you can start swallowing it. So if you, it's, that same thing can happen if you're bleeding in this area and you lean your head back, then the blood could pour down and pool and go down here, which is why, as most of you will probably intuitively understand, if you have a nosebleed, you wanna lean forward. By leaning forward, the blood is actually going to come out the nostrils. Right? It's not gonna go down your throat and then you're not tasting the blood and all of that nastiness. But to, let's, to, let's talk about how to stop that nosebleed. If it's an anterior nosebleed, well, what they recommend is you actually pinch it, right? So you actually on, like you're going to, because you wanna compress Little's area and those blood vessels. So again, I'm not gonna do this, but if you squeeze your nostrils together, you're gonna lean forward, squeeze those nostrils together, by compressing it, what you're hoping will happen very quickly is a coagulation of the blood and it'll then stop the, the blood loss, right? So you just kind of lean forward, pinch it and wait. That's literally the best thing you can do for an anterior nosebleed. A posterior nosebleed is gonna be more difficult because obviously when you're picking your nose, are you really gonna be able to get all the way back here? Can you stick your fingers all the way back here? You can't. That just doesn't really make much sense. So you can't really compress anything. So they still recommend you lean forward, but then you're gonna kind of have to wait for this to try and resolve on its own, that the body can take care of it, the blood can coagulate on its own. If it doesn't resolve in about a half an hour or so, that's when it's, a rec it's recommended that you go seek medical attention 
they have a series of things that they can do to try and stop that bleeding. But you can actually, this is actually can be pretty serious because if you, you can lose a lot of blood from a posterior nosebleed and then you can bleed out essentially. Not bleed out and die, maybe that might be too aggressive, but it can have some severe consequences because maybe you get lightheaded, maybe you pass out or something along those lines. But I want you to think about this, okay, to bring it all back together. So when you're picking your nose, right, and you're coming in here, well, what's happening is you may be trying to go for boogers. And by the way, those boogers are a product of the mucosal membranes because what'll happen is they also secrete mucus. That mucus, is going to be there to help catch pathogens. And then hopefully you will blow it out or pick it out, right? It actually makes sense to pick your nose, to pick the boogers out, those dried out crusted pieces of mucus that are containing dirt and all sorts of stuff inside of it, all right? So you go in there, you're picking your nose, but you wanna be careful because if you pick too aggressively and you scratch, say again, 90% of nosebleeds are gonna happen in Little's area, if you scratch that too much, you can rupture those blood vessels, and then it starts to bleed. But it also could be a product of just being dry. Uh, I know we live here, I live here in Salt Lake City, Utah. We're a desert as it is, and then in winter it seems to get even drier. Um, there's plenty of times that I'll be just, I remember as a kid, I'd be outside, you know, just having snowball fights and all that fun stuff, and my nose would just bleed. Maybe I bumped it or did something like that, and I cracked the mucosal membrane. That is also another possibility to get a nosebleed. But I mean, it could be trauma. It could be a whole bunch of different things. Even medications have been known to dry out those mucosal membranes, which makes them more susceptible to cracking, which then ruptures the blood vessels and you have a nosebleed. But one thing I do also wanna add real quick, as a function of those, the mucus in there is also gonna help to provide humidity to the air as you are breathing in. And so that's the thing. You also don't want to just freeze out your lungs and your respiratory tract. You don't want to dry them out either. So that's why it's important to actually have snot, the mucus. It's important to have all of these things in there. But just because you do doesn't mean you have to just let it sit there, right? Blowing your nose is a good thing. Picking your nose a little bit might also be a good thing. But just don't blow your nose too hard. Don't scratch and pick your nose too hard because you will eventually rupture some of those superficial blood vessels, and that's when you have a nosebleed. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this gross topic of nosebleeds and nose picking. If you did, be sure to like and comment on this video. Those little types of things actually help the video perform well in the algorithm so then more people can see the grossness of nosebleeds and nose picking. Also, if you wanna look awesome like me and Jonathan and wear some legitimate Institute of Human Anatomy merchandise, there'll be links down in the description below. Again, that goes to support the channel so we can continue making these awesome videos. But I guess I just wanna leave you with this. If you're gonna pick your nose, just be soft. Be like a soft little ninja. You know, just kinda of go in and out, in and out. Don't, don't be going two knuckles deep because as you just saw, that's not gonna work out too well for you.